Hey folks, Evil Pajamas here with another Civilization 6 video. It's December 2020, so we've recently had the Heroes and Legends mode. So in prior videos, I've sort of echoed the, the popular opinion that the Heroes and Legends mode offers a lot of early game versatility, but that the heroes fall off pretty hard late game. Now I'm going to concede that this is actually not entirely true. That if used correctly, the heroes can still be very powerful in the mid to later game. And we're not just talking about Hercules and Hamiko here. That just your generic um, run-of-the-mill combat heroes can actually be very effective later in the game and not just in the ancient era. This video is broken down into two distinct sections. The first being a war with Genghis Khan that was declared as a surprise war by him. And then the second, a surprise war declared by Gilgamesh. Now, in the first war, we don't utilize a hero, but in the second, we do. And the reason for this is the timing of the wars. If you are going to utilize a hero and your specific goal is to maximize their effectiveness in combat, you need to pay attention to the shift in eras. Because the hero combat strength scales based upon the era and does not change if they're summoned later in the era from when they're summoned at the beginning of the era it's most effective to summon them so that they come out right at the beginning of the era as that is when they will be the most effective in combat so the later you get the, the less the less value you're going to get out of that summon so the timing is very important so you can see around the time that Genghis Khan declares war that he has a significant military ad advantage. If you can't see that from the screen, you can see it from just the raw numbers, 230 to 55. But you can also see that it's turn 51, which means that we are more than 30 turns away from the end of the era, but more than halfway through this era. You can see we're in a rather problematic position with Caracas being attacked. It only has 26 defense and there are 10 turns from walls with only one chariot defending versus three warriors from Genghis Khan. Did I say three? What I meant to say was six, actually. So, eventually, we lose this city, which happens sometimes, which is a big setback, but that is not a time to panic. You and you can see how not panicked I am by the fact that I'm actually building Stonehenge over there in my only other city. So, I heard that's a good strategy if you were being attacked by five warriors in an undefended city. In this case, we are fortunate, and the reason we're not too panicked about losing that city is because the AI is easily distracted, and we have suzerain status to the direct south on Nalanda. And no, we did not use the exploit. We intentionally avoided using that. Um, obviously, you can see by my lack of technology here that I was not using that. But the interference run by the, the city-states uh, crossbowmen, which are much more tech than my actual army, uh, will assist in clearing out some of those troops so that we can sweep back in and take the unwalled city with minimal resistance. Another thing you can do if you are concerned with early game aggression and not having enough military, here you can see that I had left my secret society pick so that the next governor title popped up, I was able to grab the vampire for defense. Loyalty in one of our... so eventually we do stabilize and we not only take back our city but we take a nearby Mongolian city as well. Uh, now you'll notice at the point at which this occurs that Genghis Khan still has a substantially uh, better military overall might number, but they don't. The AI just doesn't play their troops very well. Now you'll notice here that's turn 123, and you're like, "Well, where's the hero?" You said at the you know the next the next age would be the good time to get the hero out. Well, because we only had two cities, our our production capacity was sort of limited, so there didn't present like a good opportunity during the, this particular war to to push that hero out. So if you were waiting to see some actual hero play here, don't fret, you've got it, because by turn 159, shortly after declaring peace with the Mongols, Gilgabro just landed up on the shore and took my capital. So here we go. Uh, you can see he also has a very superior military number. Over this time, you see there is a key difference. So as you can see, over there in our puny little three-population rebelling city, right to the east, we have three turns until 
one of our heroes comes out. This would be our, our second hero, and that brings up a point, actually, that I, I want to make. So you're going to want to at least always try and keep one other high production city, or you're going to want to summon your first hero at a lower production city because the production cost scales up. So if you only have really one high production city, you're not going to have a very easy time getting another hero out because it has to be produced in a different city. So as you can see here, Gilgabro has uh, three cuirassers, a crossbowman, and a field cannon, and my capital, which was my only encampment. And I have a crossbowman, a mostly dead catapult, and uh, on the plus side, I have two vampires, which the AI is really bad at killing in a rebelling city. So it, it looks like like this, things are pretty much lost, but that would be incorrect. So we discussed earlier in the video about how heroes scale and how they are stronger at the beginning of the era. So you see the disadvantage we are at here, and now the hero is about to pop out right at the start of the era, and you're going to see how much stronger they are if they are summoned during this part of the timeline. You can see here that our hero has spawned with 74 melee strength. So, uh, in comparison, the Curacers, which are an industrial gate cavalry, have 64 melee damage. And the exact same movement of 4. They obviously don't have the limitation of only lasting 30 turns, but they also don't raise their opponents as zombie units that are just regular units. So, yoink. Free field cannon. And then another yoink. Recursor. And then this will continue on with a, another free field cannon. And you'll see where this is going. So basically, you have to remember that each one of these is basically like getting somewhere between like 1200 and 1400 production units for just killing units that you were trying to kill anyway. So correctly timing like a powerful hero like this as opposed to getting it out during the later phase of an era where it's going to be substantially weaker can make a huge difference in how much impact your hero is going to have on the now, you might recall that I had another video where I was featured doing this, but I was doing this during, with a Barbarian camp, which is great early game, but I just wanted to show that, you know, that this is still effective during the Renaissance era. It's just a matter of timing the hero, right, so that you're getting the most effective amount of damage out of that. And obviously, not every hero is going to be like the Mayan twins, where you're getting free units out of it, but that, the... The same concept applies, like Be like Beowulf's ability is not going to be nearly as good at the end of an era because it you're not going to have greater strength than the, than the unit as, as often if you're just weaker at the end of the era. So now I think there are some exceptions to this where you aren't really relying so much on the combat abilities of the heroes. So obviously like Hamiko, is, it's not going to matter as much or there might be a lot of reasons that you're going to use like Hercules at a, a different time than right at the start of the era. But if you're using them to set up for combat, you want to make sure that you're timing them at the start of, of an era. That's it for this video. If you liked, please consider liking and subscribing. And I should be back some, with some more Civilization 6 content. And everybody uh, have a great day and enjoy your holiday season.